What's going on guys? Welcome back to my personal channel. Welcome back to another video for you guys today. In this video, we're going to be recapping West Brom 3, Chelsea 3. We're going to go through five things we learned through the match. And there is plenty to talk about, as you guys would expect. Shouldn't have been 3-0 down, even close to that, but... I'm a bit happy with the way that we recovered, the way we reacted to going 3-0 down. The Whatever was said at halftime must have revitalised the entire team because we came out like a completely different Chelsea side. And we recovered the point. I'm not going to say we won a point. It is still two points dropped. No one is going to call this a victory or anything like that. But there's positives to take out of it. I look at this and I say, Chelsea last season lose this game probably 4-1. Chelsea the season before probably lose this game 6-0. Chelsea the season before that probably lose this game 3-1, something like that. We don't win this game under any other season. And I'm seeing a bit more fight in this Chelsea squad. A bit more of a will to, I'm not going to say will to win, but desire, willpower, determination. We showed it all in bundles in, in the second half. So there are some positives to take out of it. Before I start this video, I want to say if you guys haven't done so already, please smash that like button. Press the subscribe button as well and hit the bell notification button as well to be the first guy to know whenever we release any new content on this channel. Now, we'll go straight into the first point. Bit of an obvious one, but we might as well go with the obvious one anyway. Anybody, anybody please but Marcus Alonso at left back. We know this guy struggles at left back. He barely gets by defensively at left wing back. <laughs> And, and at left wing back, I'll be real, the job is a bit easier for you guys. Not in case of stamina, in case of going up and down the pitch, but in case of responsibility. Because if you're the wing back, you're really just there to hold up width, to make, the, to make the team a lot wider, and to provide support either going forward or coming back. He's got so much more responsibility as a left back, and he can't account for any of it. He's too slow on the turn. And... I'll use that for both fullbacks. I'm not going to say Reese James was slow, but he got caught out a lot yesterday, especially in the first half. I think both the fullbacks went up way too quick. It might have been complacent tactics from Frank Lampard. I don't really know. I can't delve too deeply into that. But both fullbacks went too far forward. One of them really should have sat deep. And that meant whenever West Brom tried to hit us on a counter attack, there was only two centre backs and Willy Caballero there, which is why they were able to break against us with such a threat. It was. We walked into those. I think we were a bit complacent going forward, but it doesn't change the fact that Marcus Alonso was absolutely shocking. First goal, that that header, that start, that counter attack that went straight to a West Brom player was just so weak. Didn't try to control it, didn't try to look for a player around him, just decided to pat straight downwards to a West Brom player in front of him, and it started the counter attack. Third goal as well. He won't take the entirety of the blame for that one, but it was his fault that cost the goal. A lot of players were falling asleep, our set, piece, our set piece defending was poor, as per usual, but it was Marcus Alonso that was the guy that got caught out at the far post. The guy falls asleep way too often, he gets beaten for pace way too often, the guy was getting run up on that left hand side the entire first half. Genuinely 1 out of 10 performance from him was poor, and in the case of Lampard, I'm, in this video, I'm going to say that Lampard shouldn't be getting as much criticism as he, as he deserves. In my opinion, I understand if you're going to criticise him for starting Marcus Alonso. Because <laughs> I don't know the situation with Ben Chilwell, but he had some game time. Which makes me think he could have had some game time in this match as well. And if he could have had some game time, he would have been better than Marcus Alonso. If he couldn't have played, uh, what's his name? Azpilicueta was there. And Azpilicueta changed the game when he came on as a substitute as well because we had more defensive solidity. Yeah, you might lose a bit more going forward, but we've bought more attackers, better attackers. Attackers that are better than the ones we had last season. We don't need Marcus Alonso to come in and chip in with the odd goal or two now. It, it, we don't need that anymore. Even back then, if we're bringing, if we have this guy at left back because we can finish, then there has to be questions that are asked as well. But first point, anybody but Marcus Alonso at left back, we know it doesn't work. We've seen it fail so many times. We can't keep persisting with this. As soon as Chilwell's back, second choice wing back or something, I don't know. Maybe even that performance has brought Emerson back into the conversation. I don't know. Second point, I want to go into goalkeeper as well because... Willy Caballero, again, didn't really make much of a difference as Kepa. I don't want to sit here and flip-flop because I did say he had a great game against Barnsley and I did say we probably wouldn't have won that game with Kepa in goal. But this is why I've always said 
the goalkeeper is needed. As soon as Mendy drops in, the better, honestly. Because Willy Caballero, again, didn't really make too much of a difference. And it felt like it was a throwback to February. You remember that time last season where Kepa was getting dropped for about three, four games. Willy Caballero jumped in for all of those games. And it didn't really look like there was much of a difference. We still kept conceding goals. The goals that were being conceded... I don't really call him his fault, but I think Mendy saves them as well. It's the same thing like Kepa where he was just too, he wasn't too far out for it. He couldn't reach out his hand to get it. And here's the thing, they're both the same height as well. So if we're going to have this thing where Kepa's too small, instantly the argument is the same for Willy Caballero. I think his distribution was good and I will give him credit for that. I thought he passed the ball around the back really well and with better composure than we've seen from Kepa in recent games. But... He, again, didn't make much difference on the scoreline. And you need your goalkeeper there to be able to save games for you guys. This is why I've said do not start Willy Caballero every game. It only really makes sense to do it if Kepa's form is really that far bad. But now, at least with, with Edouard Mendy in, hopefully he'll be back for the Spurs game. I'll be real. If, if Mendy drops a clanger in that match, I really just give up for the rest of the season. But I hope, I pray, Edward Mendy is the answer. Because if he isn't the answer, we are so finished this season. Willie Capiero, I think the first goal he could have saved. Or, uh, like I said, Edward Mendy could have saved. Third goal, I'm not saying anything. But the first two, I think a better goalkeeper gets hands to it. So, Edward Mendy, sooner the better that he jumps in, honestly. Uh, third point that we're going to go into, squad depth. And... That has been a huge problem for us for so long over the last few seasons. And that's been part of the reason why we've been struggle, struggling and we've been forced into top four races. Because our squad depth, depth just isn't there to match. And when plan A isn't working, there isn't really a plan B. But there was. Half time, we did the obvious and we took Marcus Alonso straight off because that had to happen. Mateo Kovacic also came off because he weren't really having the best of games either. And he came on for hudson Doy, And... I know people will say hudson Doy should have started this game. Me, personally, I, I don't think so. I think the way Frank Lampard managed him was really good in this match because he did play against, Burn, uh, against Barnsley on Wednesday. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think he started the full 90 minutes as well. And also... He didn't have the best of performances against Barnsley either. He looked a bit rash. He looked like he was doing too much. So it didn't make sense to throw him straight into the starting 11 against West Brom as well. You don't reward a bad performance with more game time. It doesn't really... It don't make sense like that. So I get why he brought him off the bench. It was a fresh Hudson Odoi. Terrorised that entire left-hand side the second half. And got a goal to show for it. So in the case of Frank Lampard. Substitutions. Which has been a key point for saving matches for him over the last season. It came in clutch again. Our squad depth looks a lot stronger now. And that means they're more decisive in key moments. Like I said. Chelsea U. Everyone expected them to be forgotten about this season. It's the Chelsea youth that saved us in this match. And it's, that shows the depth that we have in this squad. And that is key for us because maybe they're not going to play as much as you want to see them play throughout the season. But they're going to show up in big moments because they need to take those moments to showcase why they should be playing more for Chelsea. So... More competition brings the best out of the players around them and it means that they'll be more decisive with the chances that they take. So I'm happy with the squad depth. I'm happy with the substitutions. I'm happy with the way that we turn the game around. Obviously, we should never have been 3-0 down in the first place, but I'm optimistic-ish. Fourth point I want to go into, Timo Werner, and we should talk about this performance. I'll say out of the three performances that he's had this season, that one's the worst. I think... It was kind of a victim of circumstance as well because he we, he couldn't account for us being 1-0 down after four minutes and then West Brom dropping a bit further back. Then another mistake by Thiago Silva and then West Brom dropped further back. And then 3-0 and they just don't even really need to attack at this point. And when they don't have to do that and they just focus defensively, it means that it's a lot harder to find space within the attacking third. And I think Werner struggled with that. It is something he's going to need to get a bit more used to in the Premier League. But I think that comes with time as well. I think he'll be frustrated with his finishing. There was a couple chances in the first half which he really could have taken better. And 
I already know with Werner, you're not going to get the best conversion rate with him, but you are going to get a quality finisher in there. He's going to take one of those chances eventually. I think it's just a case we need to get the ball running. You need to get that initial first goal, and then you'll really start to see the goals flowing in. Not using this point to slate him or anything, but it was a frustrating match for him. And to be honest, I'll say that for that entire attacking third in the first half. It was so stifled because West Brom just needed to defend the lead, and we gave him that lead so early into the match. It just made the game so much harder for the attackers. Frustrating game for Timo Werner, but hey, we move. Final point, and we're going to go into Frank Lampard. And the Frank Lampard out brigade was out strong after this game. Some of the points I understand. Some of the points I will say I, I didn't really get. I think Lampard does have to make a lot of progression this season. And it's not going to be as easy for him to win over the fans as it was for last season. There's going to be critics for him now. I can get you saying that I've already said about Hudson Doy not not starting. I think that was the right decision. Frank Lampard, I mean Marcus Alonso starting, you can blame him for, but he also righted that wrong and just took him off at half time instantly. People are gonna get annoyed at him for being 3-0 down, saying Chelsea should not have been 3 0 down to West Brom. But you can't really account for individual mistakes. I think Chelsea have already made more individual mistakes than anybody in the league combined this season that have directly led to goals. You cannot blame Frank Lampard. You can blame Frank Lampard for fi for uh, for playing the players that are in that position that make those mistakes, but you can't blame him for them making the mistakes. Marcus Alonso was the one making those mistakes in the first half. Reese James was the one that left that right hand side too exposed. Thiago Silva is the one that was caught in possession. Uh, Marcus Alonso was the one caught out the far post. Not Frank Lampard. Frank Lampard picked them. No one's going to blame him for picking Thiago Silva. And even in the case of Thiago Silva, it's just embarrassing. But you shrug your shoulders and you move on. He had a good game past that. Same thing with Christensen. Marcus Alonso, there was a lot of problems. Reese James, I think... He, he's had bare games. He has had bare games. But Lampard can't take the blame for individual errors. Especially when it was his substitutions that changed the game as well. And also the change in tactics that did it as well too. I don't think Lampard deserves too much criticism. I can get if there's points that you want to, that you want to point out and say you could have done better with this. Fair play. But if we're hearing Lampard out, seriously guys, come on, we're better than that. But guys... This is the end of five things. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my points. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carefree Lewis G. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Up the trails.